Good morning. I'm Cal Lord, and I am blessed to be the pastor here at Central Baptist Church in Westerly, where you are uh, either here in the sanctuary or watching from home. Uh, a couple of announcements as we come together today. We start our fall schedule. We move back to our 10.30 a.m. time. But this year it looks a little differently because we are pushing back the start of Sunday school and Christian education programs and also uh, some of the other activities like the choir. Normally on the first Sunday in September when we gather like this, the choir sings. But uh, you know uh, in the midst of uh, this pandemic, we've been kind of uh, trying to be very careful to keep everyone safe but to also continue to worship and to praise our Lord. Uh, a couple of things just to let you know about. Uh, you'll find these in the bulletin. I emailed the bulletin out to many of you, and so maybe you've already received it. Those who are here today are able to look at it. But uh, we are participating in a statewide prayer gathering, which begins next Saturday. Uh, at least uh, in spirit we're participating, but if you'd like to, they have a great week planned where every evening or a couple of afternoons, Sunday afternoons, they're going to be a gathering of folks praying for our communities and particularly for our state and for the people in our state and maybe also for our nation and our world. Uh, they plan these to be socially distanced, safe spots. They're not going to have chairs set up or anything, but we'll be gathering in a certain location. For example, a week from Wednesday, instead of our normal Wednesday night prayer service, we are going to, anybody who would like to, go up to Ashway Seventh-day Baptist Church, and right there, they've got a big tent, and they've got a place outside, and we're going to have our uh, prayer rally in the Westerly area up there at Seventh-day in place of our Wednesday night service. That's a week from Wednesday, and that'll be all part of this. Also, they're going to be walking all the way around the state. Uh, starting up in Woonsocket, coming all the way down, uh, down into the, the Westerly, Charlestown area, into Newport, and all the way back up again into Providence. And I'm going to be walking a week from Thursday uh, from Charlestown to Narragansett, or as far as I can make it. Uh, we'll see how that goes, but uh, it'll be a time of uh, a devotional guided prayer. Uh, and I don't want to put him on the spot, but Phil Bryan said, maybe I'll do it too. So uh, you can tell him, oh, I hear you're walking a week from Thursday, but... Uh, but again, we also invite all of you, starting next Saturday, just to pray. Uh, we believe that if we pray, uh, there will be changes in our state and in our communities because we believe in the power of prayer. And so we're trying to bring together all of the Christians uh, that we can to pray for our communities and our state in particular, but also our nation and our world. So that starts next Saturday, and uh, I can get you more information. I have included in a couple of my daily in updates. Also, on the 27th of this month, we have a couple of special things happening during worship. We're going to set aside a few moments to recognize our first responders. Uh, particularly, we're going to lift up those who have a connection to our church community, but also we'll say a prayer for all of our first responders. And also on that day, we're going to have a baptism. Mabel Payne is going to be baptized right here in our baptistry. So it's going to be a special day. I promise the ser sermon will be right on point, so you won't have to stay a long time. Uh, but that's the 27th. It's going to be a big day, a special day here. We are still looking for Sunday school teachers. And, uh, and so if you've got a heart for that, just please let us know. Also for the parents, uh, we've put out a, a little survey. We plan to open Sunday school on October 4th. But we really would like to hear from the parents how you feel. I know there's a lot going on. Kids are going back to school. And you may have some uh, concerns or feelings about that. Some of our teachers are going back. But uh, it, it, we really want to listen to our parents. And if you feel okay with bringing your kids back, then we're going to go ahead with it. But if you have some concerns, then we're going to listen to those concerns and then try to come up with a good decision. So parents, please get back to me or get back to Tiffany and let us know. Well, with that said, uh, the rest of the announcements are in the bulletin. I'm going to invite Karen now if she will open our worship. Good morning. I have to tell you, when I was preparing the call to worship this morning... I said a small prayer to God and said, let my words be your words, dear Lord. And I prepared the call to worship. Then I went to bed. Then I got up this morning and I found myself singing, count your many blessings. And I thought, all right, Lord, I think that's what you want me to share today. Maybe we all need just a little bit of a reminder. And it's Count Your Blessings by Johnson Oatman Jr. We've all sung it a million times, but it just lifted me up so much this morning. I won't sing it, though. I'll save you that. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, 
Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will keep singing as the days go by. When you look at others with their ban lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy, your reward in heaven, nor your home on high. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend, help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Now is our time for our invocation and prayer. If you would bow your heads with me, please, and then join me in the Lord's Prayer at the end. Oh, dear Lord, we come before you so grateful that we are able to be in this place. Grateful for those that are watching that can't be here today, but we know that they are in our hearts and in our prayers. We thank you, dear Lord, for all of your many blessings. You have truly been so good to us, and we do have a tendency to forget that sometimes. Be with us now as we hear Cal's message. Let us hear with our hearts as well as our minds, dear Lord. Lead us to where you would have us be. Right now, dear Lord, that's to recite the prayer that your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you join me in singing our first hymn? It is, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought. And the words are on the screens and printed in the bulletins. And I want to encourage those that are watching at home. One of my colleagues, Ruth Hainsworth, from the United Congregational Church said, she always tells her people at home to sing loud. That will make up for those of us who are singing a little softer or not singing in the sanctuary. So if you're at home today, sing loud. We'll hear you here, and so will God. Let's sing. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, if you're able to, let's stand. Thank you very much. Please be seated. As we gather together today, uh, we come to this time of prayer in our worship service, and actually it's a perfect lead-in to our sermon today because the title of my message is, Lord, Hear Our Prayer. And we're going to be talking about Daniel's prayer, and, uh, and so as we gather here, one of the things I want to say right up front is that prayer really is an opportunity for us to yield into God's will for our lives. 
Uh, and sometimes that brings healing to other people because then God's glory is revealed. And sometimes that brings open doors to those things that, that we've been worrying about or wondering about. And sometimes it just brings God to kind of come right into the forefront of our lives so that we can see his leading wherever uh, we're going. So this morning I want to just uh, share a couple of prayer concerns, prayer thoughts, prayer celebrations. One is you'll notice there's some beautiful flowers up here. Uh, they uh, are here in honor of Mike Grillo and Esther Nachi. They're going to be married here in the sanctuary at 1 o'clock today. And so they sent those flowers along, and they're beautiful. And so we're lifting up Mike and Esther in our prayers. We know that Esther's had some real health concerns, and right now she's at a plateau, and we, we give thanks to God for that. And so they're going forward uh, with this wedding. And so we, we pray God's blessing on them and that uh, it is, uh, it is the, the beginning step in, in a longer journey for both of them as they go as husband and wife. Also, I want to give thanks for those who came out this weekend for our work party. Uh, there was a whole group of people here on Saturday. They cleared a lot of brush. Over here, you're going to begin to see over the next several months uh, the, the real work in our memorial prayer garden. Uh, and you'll hear a lot more about it as we get into the fall and then into January as we make uh, formal presentations at upcoming meetings. But it will be a place where you'll be able to go to pray and meditate. It'll be a time where, uh, a place where uh, memorials will be established for folks who we've loved who have gone home to be with the Lord. And uh, it's going to be a nice place. So we kind of started clearing that, trees down a couple weeks ago, and a lot of hard workers. I was not among them. I brought donuts and coffee. That's what I do best. I was in the church praying for all of them that they wouldn't get stung by bees or catch poison ivy. But it, it was great. And then I heard today that, uh, that Bob Chipperfield was here too the day earlier and doing some of the cleaning and, and maybe some of the others of you. I know Nancy Gibson is off and out doing some of the gardening around the church. And, and so we thank all of you for your efforts to, to work around the church here in those ways. I want to think of, in particular, the Chipperfield family today. Uh, received word this week that Pat had passed away. Uh, Pat and Dick, over the last few years, were very uh, active uh, members of our Sunday morning worship crew here. Uh, Pat always came in with a big smile and uh, always seemed to have that joyful mood, and, uh, and it just uh, was a blessing to get to know her a little bit. Uh, this time of the coronavirus has been hard on them. They've both been at the Royal Nursing Home, and uh, and Pat's health really began to fail, and, and then she passed, and now she's with the Lord. So we think of Dick, who's still there at the Royal Nursing Home, and we know that it'll be a big loss for him, and we think of their family, their children, and uh, the extended family as well. We think of Bob and Diane, and, uh, and many of them who have grown up and been a part of this church over the years. Uh, there will be a service for Pat at some point uh, at St. Clair's Church. She was a Roman Catholic, and so they're going to do that there. So uh, look for that. Uh, also, today as we gather together, we want to just lift up Dave Collings. Uh, I've been talking to him and Minnie. Uh, Dave went in. He had an angiogram, and uh, they found he's got some blockages, so they're going to have to plan some surgery for him. And so it's a scary thing. Um, we lift up Dave in our prayers. We, we just pray everything goes well, uh, and we pray for Minnie as well. I want to lift up Bruce Titterington. He's had some problems over the last few months uh, with his kidneys, and so we just pray that everything is, is working well. I want to lift up Amy O'Brien and a woman named Isabel. I want to lift up our next-door neighbor, Susan. Heard some good news this week. Susan uh, is just a delight, uh, and she lives next door in our parsonage, and she uh, has been having some tests, and a couple of the tests have come back uh, negative, and so that's relieved her. She's still having more tests, so we told her that we'd be praying for her, and uh, we'll continue to do so. I want to lift up Anika Hall in our continuing prayers, and John Sr., Valerie LaPointe, Regina Pendleton. I want to lift up Rosa Scarano, Sophia's mother. I want to continue to lift up the Engler family. Uh, there's been some health concerns there, and so we just pray for healing, and we pray for God's presence. I want to lift up uh, Norm Stedman and Marie uh, Caradillo in our continuing prayers. I happen to watch online a memorial service for Jennifer Johnson. And we've been praying for Jennifer for quite a while. Jennifer and David are Paul Johnson's brother and sister-in-law. Jennifer passed away. Uh, I worked with Jennifer with our American Baptist family in Connecticut. She was a, a president of the region uh, a couple of years before I was. And just a wonderful Christian woman. And uh, she really battled with cancer. 
uh, in the memorial service, there was a beautiful part. There was a young man from somewhere in Africa, and he had immigrated to this country. And, uh, and Jennifer was one of the people that he met when he first came to the First Baptist Church in New Haven. And uh, he didn't have any family there, and he came in one day, and he was up, and he was telling the story that one of the first people to greet him was Jennifer. And when he said that he was new, he had just come, and he didn't have any family, and he was looking for a church home, and she said, well, I'm going to be your mom now, as long as you're in America. And he said, so I wanted to say she was the best mom I ever had in this country. And so it was a great testimony to her love and her Christian spirit. So we think of her husband, David, who's been battling uh, disease himself. We think of Paul and others in their family. And so these are a few of the folks we lift up. I have a couple of friends, Allison and Fran, who've been under doctor's care, and so I lift them up as well. And, uh, and maybe you've got some folks that you're thinking of today. I want to encourage you in the next moment of silence just to, to talk with the Lord, to come to Him and to share whatever concerns you have, whatever names come to mind, and give them to Him and let God uh, minister to them. So let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that we can come to you. Even, Lord, when we're not aware of it, you are always close by. You promised that you would never leave us, and so that we know in those times of trial and those uh, moments when we're facing our own mortality, when we're dealing with death or sickness, Lord, we know that uh, sometimes our, our minds uh, seem to wander to the worst of things. And yet, Lord, we know that you're right there with us. You promised that you won't leave us. And so, Lord, as we think of these individuals who we've named this morning, whether they're publicly named or just on our hearts and minds today, Lord, we know that you are with them, and we know that you're ministering to them, and we know that you're doing it through the power of your Holy Spirit as the great physician. We know that you're working through doctors and nurses and caregivers. And so, Lord, we, we pray for all of them today, and we pray that in the midst of whatever struggles these individuals are going through, that they will see and see your face and know that you are present and that you have not forgotten them, that you are working for their salvation and for their healing. Lord, we thank you for these things. Lord, today we celebrate with Michael and Esther, and we pray, Lord, that you will continue to bring good health to Esther and that you'll watch over Michael and that you will bless them as they uh, share their vows this day. We pray, Lord, that you will be with the, the Chipperfield family as they mourn the loss of this good woman. And we pray, Lord, that they will feel your presence. And Lord, that you will be with Dick, especially in the days ahead. Lord, we ask you to hear our prayers for these friends and neighbors. Lord, we continue to lift up our community. We lift up our state and our nation. Lord, even as, as people are coming together this week to pray, oh Lord, we pray that, that our voices might be amplified. And whether we are part of a larger group or we're praying in our homes, Lord, that our prayers will be effective. Lord, you told us that the prayers of a righteous man, a righteous woman, will be effective. So, Lord, hear our prayers in the coming days for our state, for our nation, and for our world. And boy, does our world need prayer. Oh, Lord, we need to have a, a witness of a faithful people rise up to bring justice to every situation, to bring hope to the hopeless, and to bring healing to the sick. Lord, may we come together as a people of prayer across this state and across this nation. Lord, we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Now hear the prayer that we say together as a congregation that we find printed in our bulletins. Heavenly Father, as we face the challenges of this new season, deep in our faith, give us strength for each day and the hope for the future. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to just take a moment now and just talk to the children. I know Sarah's here and, and maybe a few children are watching at home. And, you know, it is still baseball season, and so I, I like to use these illustrations. I have an old bat with me today, and it's kind of beat up, and it's well used, and you can see the marks of where the balls have hit it and probably where it's been in the dust. It looks like there's some stickers on it, and, and then there's one thing that is really precious to me. There is a signature on that, and that signature is from a, a player who played on the Detroit Tigers. Now, you probably have never heard of him. His name is Marcus Tem. Marcus played also on the Connecticut uh, team, the Norwich Navigators, a number of years ago. And, uh, and he was one of my favorite players just because I saw him up at Dodd Stadium and then I knew he was playing for my Tigers. 
But this old bat is pretty well worn out. You can see it used to have tape, and the tape is all kind of frayed and faded now. And, and you know, that's what happens. And I think about the fact that as we get older, sometimes that happens to us too, right? We get a little worn out. We get a little frayed around the edges and whatnot. And sometimes we feel that, well, maybe we can't do all the good things we used to do. Now, I know you young people, you're young and you've got a lot of energy and you're having fun. And, and so you don't think about that, but someday you will. Uh, but I want to give you a word of hope today because along with that bat, I have another one here. If I can get it out. And this bat looks like it's brand new. Now, I have to tell you, it's never been used out on a baseball field, although I've been tempted. But what makes this bat so special is it's got my name on it. And it's brand new. And it looks like it, looks like it just came right out of the factory. Well, you know what? God promises all of us that if we trust in him, even if some things happen in our life and we kind of get hurt or we, get a, we become afraid of something and, and maybe... Uh, things aren't going our way, that God has the power to make us always like new. We can be just like this bat, so beautiful and fresh looking. All we need to do is go to God and say, God, I need your help today. I'm having a bad day. And God can take that bad day and turn it around and make it a good day. You know, that's what prayer does. In our sermon today, we're going to be talking about prayer. And God calls all of us that when we are feeling sad, when we are feeling distant from God, and maybe we're feeling far away and God doesn't hear our prayers, God always hears our prayers. And all we need to do is lift up a prayer. And when we pray, God renews our heart and he makes us like new. So boys and girls, I just want to encourage you, you know, you, some of you have gone back to school now and that's maybe been exciting and for some maybe it's been a little scary. Maybe mom and dad have been scared. Well, you need to tell them just kind of take a moment and say a prayer to Jesus and that'll help take away some of the fear because God will be with you no matter what you're going through. Well, God bless you, boys and girls, and uh, again, thank you, and, and I hope that someday soon we'll see you back as we start up Sunday school again and youth group. And, uh, and we'll talk to you again. God bless. I'm, I'm going to ask now for uh, Dave and Scott to come up, and they're going to share some special music with us. It's kind of nice. Our choir, as I said, our choir probably won't be starting up anytime real soon because we want to be very, very careful with uh, all the social distancing and all the things we've been taught. So uh, we, we're going to do some special music here. We've got some things planned some of these weeks in September and October. And today, we're putting these guys on the spot. We're inviting them back to share with us.
Come join the sinners, you have been redeemed. Take, Take your, your place beside the Savior. Ooh. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come to the table. To the thief and to the doubter. To the hero and the coward. To the prisoner and the soldier. To the young and to the older. All who hunger, all who thirst. All the last and all the first. All the paupers and the princes. All who fail, you've been Beside the Savior, sit down and be set free. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Thanks, guys. <laughs> How good was that, huh? Okay, it's time for our scripture, and the scripture today is taken from Daniel chapter 9, verses 15 through 19. Now, now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, Turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the inequities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and the petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, listen. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O oh my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. Blessed be the reading of the Lord. This morning, we had our parking lot service, and there were about 25 people there, and they got to hear a little shorter version of this sermon. Now, I'm not encouraging you next week to come to the parking lot for a shorter sermon, but um, we're trying to keep that service to about a half an hour. Today, we're going to be about 45 minutes or so. But this morning, in a message titled, Lord, Hear Our Prayer, I want to look at the prayer of the prophet Daniel here in chapter 9. Uh, we like to think about the book of Daniel as an apocalyptic, you know, an end time prophecy. For many, it's like we're reading a mystery book, uh, trying to figure out where all the pieces of the puzzle fit and what the future will hold. Uh, the truth is that there is a lot of prophecy in Daniel, and we've seen some of it in our messages in the past as, as dreams have come up and interpretations of dreams. But there's also some practical tips on how to live our faith in challenging circumstances. And I would, I would say that we are living in challenging times. And so we look to Daniel and uh, we see what wisdom there is from the Word of God. For example, this prayer tells us a lot about prayer in general. 
Pastor and author John MacArthur calls Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9 the single greatest model of prayer in the Old Testament. And that's saying a lot because the book of Psalms has a lot of prayers. And so do some of the other prophets and leaders. But John MacArthur compares it in importance to Jesus' model prayer, what we usually refer to as the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. He lifts it up that high. The setting for the prayer is about 535 B.C. in the first year of the reign of King Darius. The Medes and the Persians now have replaced Babylonia as the great power in the region. Scholars suggest that Daniel has been deeply influenced by his reading of Jeremiah and particularly Jeremiah chapter 29. And he begins to feel that the exile is going to end soon. You know, it's very true that when we look at Scripture, even if it's the ancient Scriptures of the Hebrew text, we can see some similarities to our circumstances. And I just wanted to share with you a little bit out of Jeremiah 29. It says here, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. And also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. And then it says here, And I will fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place in 70 years. And so we, we, we get this sense that Daniel, who came as a young man, a teenager, into Babylonia in the exile, is now much older. Some scholars speculate he's in his early 80s, and, and he's looking back on a lifetime lived in Babylonia. And he reads this passage in Jeremiah. And he sees the similarities because he looks around and so many of his people have already established themselves in the towns and cities of Babylonia. Many of them have married. They've set up business. And some of them have even begun to worship the gods of the Medes and the Persians and the Babylonians. But he sees that number 70 years and he knows that they've been there nearly 70 years and he's saying that maybe God is speaking to us as well through the words of Jeremiah. You know, when Daniel looks, though, at the culture around him and sees what so many of his fellow Israelites have been doing, it makes his heart sad because they were God's chosen people. They were called to be a light to the nations and reflect the glory of God. Yet the shine had come off of them. So Daniel prays this prayer. Now there are a few things you need to know about Daniel and about praying in difficult times. First off, Daniel is one of the few people who we meet in Scripture whose flaws are not apparent and aren't even mentioned. He seems to be blameless. He's passed every test. Yet Daniel understands that as he comes to God, he is just as guilty as the rest of the nation. It's this idea that the Apostle Paul lifts up in the book of Romans when he declares, all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Daniel understands that maybe he can't find something that he is blameless for. But he knows that he's not perfect. And he knows that he's as guilty as the rest of them, even though his sin may not be the same. So he prays for himself and his people in this prayer. You know, prayer isn't just asking God to do something for you. We often ask God to heal our friends. We ask God to open doors for us. We ask God to change our challenging situations. And our prayers are usually about what we want. We look at our world and our situation and we say, God, change everything. Make it better. Bring blessings my way. As we look at Daniel's prayer, we notice that there are two important aspects of prayer that are a part of it. First, Daniel understands that prayer is not simply a means of getting God to do something for us. When Daniel prays, he anticipates that God is going to make a change in him as he prays. And you know, spending time with God does that. The more time you spend with the Lord, the more time you, you, tend, to, you tend to become like Him. It's kind of like they say about married couples. You know, you've been married a long time, all of a sudden you start to look alike. 
Oh, that's your dog. Yeah, yeah. It is kind of funny when you look at, no, I'm going to get in trouble there. I was going to say some people's dogs and then, well, no. But the truth is, is that when you spend time with the Lord, when you really spend time, you begin to become more like him. That's what Jesus did with his disciples. They spent that time together. And the hope was that when the disciples were with the master, they would become more like him and then be able to carry on his mission into the world. And so Daniel understands that as he spends time in prayer, that there's going to be changes in him that will take place. The second thing we learn here is that a prayer that can truly change me begins with God's word and ends in bringing God glory. Effective prayer always begins with hearing God's voice and ends with a changed life and a testimony to God's grace. You know, in the olden days in many of our Baptist churches and some of the other traditions, they used to have testimony time. Maybe it was on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night where people would get up and they'd share their stories of what God was doing in their lives, how God was transforming and changing them. Somewhere along the way, many of our churches have kind of left that behind. But the truth is, is that all of us have testimonies. And if we had the time and the energy for it, each of you could probably get up and talk about what God has done in your life. And Daniel understands that when you have a life of prayer, there's going to be a testimony to the glory of God that will come out of it. The beautiful thing about Daniel's prayer here is that it could be universally applied to all situations. So I want to point out five things about prayer that we find here in Daniel's prayer in chapter 9. The first is that prayer should always begin in God's Word. I think about Don West. Uh, Don, when he gave a testimony here a couple years ago, talked about how he began every morning by opening his Bible and kind of reading a section of Scripture and then praying on it. Prayer and God's Word go together. And again, many of us don't think of it that way. Maybe we haven't been part of our tradition. You know, whenever I think about prayer, I like to mention Reverend Eugene Bronson. He was my predecessor at the Cross Mills Baptist Church. And when I met him back in the early 1980s, he was really crippled up with arthritis. And and I remember as a young pastor, I kind of foolishly said, you know, I feel so sorry for you, Reverend, because, you know, you can't do the ministry you used to do when I heard it was such a great ministry. (laughs) Oh, gee, that's, that's the foolishness of youth to say that to a seasoned pastor. He looked at me, though, and he took pity on me and he said, you know what? He said, even though I can't do what I used to do, I still have a ministry. He showed me this long list, and he said, every single day, I pray through my list three times. And young pastor, you're on my list. You and that church that you're serving. (laughs) And he had good cause as a young pastor. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying through a list. We all have a list at church and we pray the names. But we learn from Daniel that true prayer, the kind of prayer that changes lives and situations, is more than just praying through a list of wants and needs. It begins in God's Word. Daniel just didn't wake up that morning and pull out his prayer list. He began by reading God's Word, particularly this passage from Jeremiah. And it informed what he was going to pray about. Now, make sure you hear me carefully. I'm not saying that it isn't great value to pray through a list the way we pray through. Nor am I suggesting we shouldn't pray for those things that God brings to our hearts and minds throughout the day. It's good to be continually conversing conversing with God and lifting up the concerns or the joys on your heart. But I think it's important to note here that before he even started praying, Daniel spent time reading the Word of God given to Jeremiah And then Daniel prayed based upon what God revealed there. You know, one-way conversations are not fun. When you're talking and you know the other person isn't listening, it can be frustrating. Imagine how God feels. He's spoken to us through His Word. And so many of us can simply ignore it. We neglect to read it. Then we start asking God for things that He's already promised if we just follow in His steps. The second thing to note in Daniel's prayer is that he goes from reading the Word to reflecting on God's character. He says this in verse 4, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments. 
But Daniel doesn't stop there. You'll notice that throughout the rest of his prayer, he continues to focus on who God is. He focuses on God's righteousness that requires him to judge the sins of people. Then he speaks of God's mercy and forgiveness. Daniel has a very healthy, balanced understanding of who God is and what his character is. God is a loving God who keeps his promises and extends mercy and forgiveness. But at the same time, he's a righteous God who requires judgment for man's sins. I was talking with someone this week, and they said they were, they were witnessing to someone about their faith and whatnot. And this young person who really didn't have much church background couldn't understand why Jesus had to die. And probably, maybe you've asked that question, or people you've been with ask that question. If God is so loving, then why did Jesus have to die? Why did, if it's his son, why did he have to die on the cross? That seems cruel. It seems unloving. Daniel, although this was several hundred years before Christ came, Daniel would understand that because of God's righteousness, a sacrifice had to be made. And that sacrifice could only be the most precious one. And that's why Jesus died. Almost every passage of Scripture has something to teach us about God's nature and character. And when we reflect upon those traits as we pray, it helps change our focus from what I want God to do for me to what God wants to do in me. As we put it earlier, it helps me pray in a way that makes a difference in me. The third thing we see in Daniel's prayer is that he refuses to lay blame on everyone else. And I said earlier, and it's true, I wish some of our congressional and presidential candidates and, and all these people in power would learn that. Everybody tries to blame everybody else for all the problems in the world. But Daniel doesn't do that. Even though he's blameless, he understands that he is there and he's a part of the people. And if something is going to happen, that he needs to confess his part in all of it. Daniel was probably the most righteous man who ever lived. And if we were in his shoes, I'm pretty sure we would have prayed maybe like the Pharisees did in the parable Jesus told in Luke 18. You remember that? The Pharisee goes like this, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like that tax collector over there. There's too much of that going around. But Daniel would not stoop to that. It would have been so easy for him to look around and put himself on a pedestal, complain about the problems, but Daniel doesn't do that. Daniel understood that he was part of that whole. So 32 times in this prayer, he associates himself with the people of Judah. Beginning in verse 5, he prays, we have sinned. In verse 6, he prays, we have not listened. And he continues to pray, we, us, and are throughout the rest of the prayer. This is especially important for us as Christians in this nation and in this world to understand. We have a tendency to blame everyone else for all the problems that we have all done things to forsake God in our own lives. So when we pray, we shouldn't come to cast stones, but rather pray like Daniel and say, God, we have sinned. Which points to the fourth thing. We're all in need of God's mercy. Daniel understood that and incorporated that into his prayer. Daniel uses five different verbs to describe how his people had sinned against God in verse 5. He says, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly, we have rebelled, we have turned aside from your commandments and rules. And throughout the rest of the prayer, he continues to acknowledge the sins of his people. Then in verse 14, as we jump to that passage which was just read, he declares that because of their sin, God is righteous in his judgments on them. Daniel never tries to explain, ignore, justify, or rationalize either his own sins or those sins of the nation of Judah. As righteous as Daniel had been during the entire time in the exile, he never thought God owed him. He understood that every good thing that had happened to him during the exile was strictly because God had put mercy in his life. So all he can really ask from God is that God will treat his people with mercy. And in verses we read this morning, that's exactly what, God do, what Daniel does. He pleads for God's great mercy. Now let's be honest. We tend to think that God owes us something because we're more righteous than everyone else. 
We go to church every week. We do pick up our Bible once in a while. We try to live by the golden rule. So sometimes we get mad and upset because God doesn't remove the difficult circumstances or heal our disease or give us more of what we think we need. But believe me, none of us wants what we deserve. The Apostle Paul deals with that a lot in his letters. So that's why, like Daniel, we need to be praying for God's mercy. Finally, think for a moment about why Daniel prayed this prayer. What was his motivation? As far as we know from historical records, Daniel never made it back to his home in Jerusalem. So his prayer was clearly not about how it was going to benefit him. Daniel's prayer request here is that God would act in God's own best interests so that God would get the glory. There was a, a, a book that came out a few years back, several years now, uh, The Prayer of Jabez. And there's this short passage, it's like two sentences, where Jabez is lifted up as a man who said a prayer, and what he wanted for, was for God to extend his territory so that God's glory could be revealed. He wasn't saying, oh God, give me more so that I can do great things for your name. But essentially what he was saying is, God, if you give me more, then your glory is going to be just shining forth even more and more. And I think that's what Daniel is saying here too. Lord, be merciful to your people so that your glory might shine again through them. According to verse 16, Daniel understood that the people of Judah had become a byword to the surrounding nations. This people and city were called by God's name, no longer had an effective testimony for God. People scorned them. They looked at them and said, oh, their God has forgotten them. How great, how weak, how terrible is their God. To the surrounding nations, their exile made it look as if God had left them for nothing. So Daniel's prayer was that God would forgive them, not so that his people could have a better life. Well, that, that would happen but rather because that would restore the testimony of God's people. You see, it's not all about us. Going back to our first point, God's Word reveals that it's all about God. God blesses us so that we can be a light to reflect His love and mercy and to reveal His glory to the world. On, um, on Wednesday night, I referenced uh, Rick Warren's book. Uh, what's the name of it? <laughs> Purpose Driven Life, yeah, yeah, and hey, yeah, Rick, I'm sorry there, I, 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 it's not on my notes here, but on Wednesday night, we, we referenced uh, Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, and the, the first words in that book is, is that it's not about you. You see, if we're going to find hope and meaning and purpose in our life, it's not about us, it's about what God is doing in and through us, what God is doing around us, and Daniel understood that, and that was Daniel's prayer, that the people would find their meaning in life. They would get their shine back, if you will, as they turn back to God and God let them move forward. You know, last week, Jim Collins gave me an old horn he had found. He thought uh, uh, from his visit to the Watch Hill Firehouse, they have a collection of, of antiques and, and different uh, memorabilia there. And so he had found this, and Jim can tell you the whole story about it. But uh, I took that, that horn. It was one of those old horns before they had, you know, the big megaphones and, and the, the, now they have the, the walkie-talkies and the, all that stuff. Um, they used to use it so that the chiefs could shout out to the different battalions what to be doing and they would hear it. Well, I gave that to the chief at the department and, uh, and I took it out of the bag and, and then I, I, I said to him, I said, do you want it? And he said, put it back in the bag. And at first I thought he was going to say, no thanks. But then he said, I want to take it home with me and shine it up so that it looks like it is supposed to look. You know, it's kind of like, kind of like this bat with my name on it. It looks brand new. It's shiny, and it's a great keepsake. But God does that to us when we go to Him in prayer and say, may your glory be revealed through us. Not so that we can sit on a shelf somewhere, but so that we might go out into the world as a testimony, as a light reflecting His glory in the world, so that all the world might come to that day where every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You see, that's what God wants to do to you and me. He wants to wipe away the tarnish of sin so that we can live with the luster of His glory. And I would pray that that might be part of our every prayer. 
Yes, pray for those things that are on your heart and mind, for your friends and for your neighbors. But as a part of your prayer life, also pray that God's will be done, that God's glory be revealed, and He might show you and me the way that that can be done. That's what we learn from Daniel's prayer. And may we embody that with our prayers. Amen. We're going to close our service today by singing a prayer that asks for God's guidance. Guide me thou, O thou great Jehovah. lawn or wherever you can feel free to chat with your neighbors may the god of glory lead you forward this week so that you can reflect his love and his grace in the world all around amen, amen.